I also apologize for not having a paper, and therefore this is going to be a very uh, perhaps inadmissible attempt to present an idea that I'm not able to defend in a full paper. So I'm begging, indulge, indulging you, begging for your forgiveness and, and uh, patience as I try to work through this presentation. So when I say constructing, I, I obviously don't mean deconstructing and I don't mean reconstructing either. So when I say constructing, that presumes the idea of constructing something from nothing perhaps, or just a new construction. Maybe it has that ambition and unfortunately arrogance, but to be clear, this is a construction and not a reconstruction of something that may have occurred, but didn't. I always like to give up my cards, so to speak, like as if we're playing cards, the ingredients when I'm cooking, these are the texts I always have to come back to. That's how it began and this is what I continue to do. I don't need to go through all of these, but just to give you a sense of, you know, what am I taking in terms of attempting this project? Of course, coming back to section 65, quite frankly, it's all of being in time. And in particular, um, certainly what's what's prior to section 65, but it really has to do with the encounter with Hegel, which comes in 82, uh, which towards the very end in chapter six. Mm -hmm. So mostly division two, but, um, in particular, the ecstatic temporality, which is given in only 10 pages, at least in the English translation, you know, the uh, real kind of sense of what he's trying to culminate towards after Zorga, after care, and then death, and then resolve, resoluteness, and Schlossenheit, and then time. Hegel, uh, for those of you that are familiar, at the end of Reveal Religion, he too is concerned with the Parsi in the sense that he, he admits at that point, before he gets to his culminating chapter, absolute knowing, absolute vision that there is something beautiful, God equals spirit, Christian truth is revelation, it is the penultimate step before philosophy takes over religion. But if you read the last paragraph in Reveal Religion, the Offenbarlichkeit Religion, um, he says that, okay, Christian truth has its trinity, but it still has this awaiting, this mysterious transfiguration, therefore a schism between present and future that has to be overcome, which would be the distinction between first and second. I don't want to get into the science of logic. We spoke about that last time, but um, I allude to the problem of a quadruplicity, which most people may want to bring back to a Trinitarian structure in Hegel. I don't. I don't read Hegel in that way. Maybe more heterodox, but I really take seriously because of it. Maybe the Derridian training I've had, or the the kind of postmodern poststructuralist take on Hegel, that there there's perhaps another way to think about fundamentally what he's doing at the very end in his metaphysics. Um, Heidegger throughout the 20s, um, I got the book, Logic, the Question of Truth, that lecture from 1925, well, before the Kant books, 27 to 29. There, uh, of course, there's a concern with schematism, but the first analogy of experience, that's the famous definition. Time is that which does not change. Time is substance permanence in order for change to take place within it. And time itself is never an object of experience. It's not priori intuition. Book seven, uh, sorry, book 12 of the metaphysics, the most theological, ontotheological part of the metaphysics. That part seven is a famous paragraph where he talks about this must be God. God is, is his life and duration, which of course Heidegger will pick up on in both Aristotle and Aquinas. The Parmenides compared to the Sophist or the Philobus or the Phaedrus, where we know Heidegger had lectures on, but the Parmenides is for me the most complex of Platonic texts, I think. Platonists might tell you that too, if you've ever read it, um, especially on this question of the interlinkage of being in time, the paradoxes that Plato unfolds, to the point where even a great Hegel has to say this is the greatest aesthetic achievement in the ancient dialectic. And um, Heidegger himself alludes to it, the beauty of it in the introduction of being in time. Okay. We know being in time, we know the table of contents, we know the main terms. My view is that, you know, division three could look like instead of the being of time, which he asks about, the distinction between being in time and the intermediary figure, the analytic of Dasein that has to be built before we can get into those big questions and even attempt to answer anything like the meaning of being, the time is horizon for that understanding. Uh, what about the being of God's time? Eric discussed the parousia. Well, if I want to hypothesize being is four-dimensional time, 
involving these types of interrelations, which is not Heideggerian language. So again, I'm, I'm asking for some indulgence here. I'm not pretending to get Heidegger right. This is a, an appropriation that I'm, I'm trying to take out of, but it requires the deepest reckoning with them. It begins and ends with the reckoning of Heidegger. But I need to move with these other types of antinomies, origin, other than origin, end of the end, non-origin, other than non-end, and uh, non-end, other than non-end. And I'll be clear as to why I'm trying to develop these ideas. Well, it has to come back to, as Eric discussed, those very early lectures, and in that, an actual engagement with the biblical text. And that might make people uncomfortable because they're saying, hey, I don't want to talk about the Bible and the New Testament content and the themes and the concepts. Well, this is the early Heidegger. Heidegger was the failed theologian and Jesuit prior to that and didn't get the chair in Freiburg. Um, they gave it to somebody else. And then as Eric was just discussing, it was very complex, lots of secondary literature uh, leading up to the Anglo-American reception, as I think um, James or Miles, I forgot who said it, that the Anglo-American world, he came in through the Jesuits and then on the Protestant side, uh, you know, through Protestant theology. I'm sorry, folks, but we have to talk about the Bible. So here are some questions I want to pose that you don't get explicitly in those phenomenology of religious life lectures. Is the ontology of the Antichrist or of the true notion of the second coming discernible in their differences if we reduce them phenomenologically? We empty out any kind of the biblical content or the intuitions we might have, either through our own upbringing in faith or those of us that have converted into Christianity. But, the, you know, any theological content, any historicist content, you know, we're not talking about the actual content that's given to us in the text. We've got to reduce them. What shall be decided in taking the place of the Christian Trinity? What are the relational differences inscribed in the distinction of Antichrist and Second Coming? This is back to just straight up Heidegger. We know from Heidegger, time cannot be represented as concept, representation of the concept of the thing. It's not the pure a priori contentless intuition. It's not subject or objective. Eric mentioned that it's being present, less it recapitulates the idol presence. All we have is a being a God beyond any dialectics and Trinitarianism. Before we even get into Arianism, maybe it, it, it is as the event of transformation. My hypothesis of four-dimensional time, it's interrelational movement event. We'll get into that. Following Heidegger, it has to be irreducible to any linguistic representations of presence. Any imaginal thematization of time is Past is no longer now, present is now, future is yet to be now. It's linear, it's rectilinear, it's circular. You can't spatialize it. Don't reduce it to presence and don't, you know, just assume that the future and past are negations of that presence. Expectation of the future, some actual event that's going to occur. Past is some real event that took place. World War II, for example, real historical events. We can't think of time in that way. Lastly, ontology of Antichrist as the intermediary in between the idea of first coming, the Gospels of the New Testament, the, the life of Christ, the pre-existent Logos, the prologue to Gospel of John, past the resurrection to his ascension, and then the sending, the filioque, for at least the Catholic tradition, Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit, who is present now in earthly time before the second coming, um, as opposed to the Orthodox tradition, which says only the Father sends the Holy Spirit. But in the Catholic tradition, I'm going with the Catholic tradition, Sending of the by the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. So Antichrist between that structure, but then this mysterious second coming with no content. Well, how do we understand its expectation? Or could it be entirely other? That this is a scary thing. You know, if it's a moment, as Hegel would say, in on route to fulfillment of a second coming, then it's trapped within Christianity. If it's totally other to Christianity, it's probably a scarier threat than the scary figure that Christianity already prophesizes about an actual antichrist. You have to totally supplant Christianity. The dream of Nietzsche, for example. Okay, these are the four points I need to reckon with. Four points to consider the ecstatical structure of historical time. That's between linear chronological time, we're not talking about that, nor the eternal soteriological temporalization, the Gregorian calendar, the BCAD, the eternal revelation of Christian truth in the AT. So not, neither of those two types of concepts of historical time. It's very early Heidegger, by the way. First coming, I already mentioned that. Most of us know what that refers to. Um, this is not going to get into the issue of Heidegger and Judaism, let alone we have to bracket the massive question of the 
the Nazi question and the black notebooks and the anti-Semitism. But this, as an isolated piece, which we don't get in Heidegger, at least not here, is uh, the absolute necessity to engage the Hebrew Bible in the Hebrew and their apocalyptic text. Antichrist only appears as a word in first and second letters of John, which may or may not be the gospel writer John. Paul, of course, Paul and Corpus, and then the last book, the book of Revelation. Same with the Parousia, throughout the Gospels, definitely at Paul, and then once again, book of Revelations. The real fourfold temporalization of these underpins the human anthropos bus, either linear time or notions of origin and eschatological. And so before, how did linear time within time is even arise? That's a being in time's questions. That inauthentic sense, it's derived from something that's buried, forgotten, leveled, when we think of time that way. Got to get to that or temporality, as he says in 1925. Primordial temporality is the word in the uh, Ushpul Misha and, um, and being in time. So the early works are important. That's what this conference is about. And um, the post being in time works before the care. Alfred and other experts can tell me how you want to date the care. But for me, 1927, let's before 1931, 32. And he takes a sabbatical. He leaves. Yeah. He stops writing. And then he, of course, becomes the rector of Freiburg. So that's what I mean by post being in time, but before the care. Okay, I want to, before being mindful of time, 12, 12, I do want to read some passages from the phenomenology of religious life and being in time, because that's where that can bring us together. We can leave behind everything I just said about my project, but together I want us to interpret some of these texts together and see what we, how do we think about them? And, and then, of course, um, section 65, I have some main paragraphs that I want to look at in being in time. Well, let me just fast forward briefly to what a synthesis for me looks like as the architectonic. The Antichrist is the being of God's time as a set of interrelations of origin other than origin, end other than end, non-origin other than non-origin, non end of those antinomies that I, I want to develop beyond any kind of succession of simultaneity. That's a problem in Kant's substance because any two events in terms of our, the way we're limited in terms of our human cognition, the reason we can only see two events in those two ways, there's no, there's nothing beyond. That's the limit that Kant tries to excavate in terms of how far metaphysics can go. There's nothing we can do, but we have to stay in that space of thinking so we don't think in successive or simultaneous terms about all these antinomies. I'm not a late Heidegger person. I, I stupidly, you can say, take the most abstract anodyne ideas that he talks about in the mirror play, let's say the thing, but I don't want to turn to these terms that he refers to, earth, sky, morals, and divinities. That's his, those are his words. But he talks about the reflecting and shining and the, the four within the oneness and the oneness within the four. Uh, this is after the care, but nor before, with the works right after being in time, the 27, 29 to 31 space, the books on Kant, the book on Leibniz, the book on boredom and solitude, all kinds of other uh, terminology he uses to talk about temporality. That's not, I'm not gonna repeat those gestures, but the late Heidegger in terms of the poetic kind of dimension, I leave out. I wanna take seriously the idea of four dimensional time, which he, of course he tries to come back to in 1962. So four dimensional time, four equals one, not three equals one. Three equals one in terms of the tradition, the ontotheological tradition, where Christianity is central for Western metaphysics. One of the persons of the Trinity, Jesus, and the Chalcedonian substance, just that second person has two natures, human and divine. So we're not dealing with three equals one, and within the three, the two, the second person, the son, with his two natures, human and divine, unmixed, inseparable, neither, both true and complete, Altheus and Thalos, um, but neither dividing or changing the other. That's the mystery of the substance, how can you be both? That's how the heresies were defeated to establish the canon of what the, the meaning of the sun is. So the NT Gospels on the pre-existent logos, birth, life, death, and resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, Jesus Christ, those are the basic events, metaphysical or otherwise, in the NT. We're going to go through section 65, and we're going to see a few passages in both Galatians and Thessalonians from the Pauline Corpus. 
The idea is to take the, that early phenomenology of religious life lecture and put that back into section 65, especially the ending of it. Those of you that are familiar with being in time, what happens in the end of section 65, he introduces equa primordiality. But he, he can't develop it. Then he moves on to 66, and then we're off to chapter five. Uh, chapter four, sorry, the everyday registers of temporality. But chapter three, where section 65 sits, it just kind of ends abruptly. And we're like, okay, what do we do now? The mirror play of those, the, the coming towards the having been making present, the zukumt as a hyphen, we have to get into that. I am my having beenness, the making present, the end presenting, which shows up later in the post 27 works. But equipomordiality is key for me, not the mirror play of the fourfold. I don't, can't deny, of course, that all these other texts leading up to are central. I don't have, um, I tried to change this slide, but I'm, of course, missing quite a few other essential texts. 1923, the intro, introduction to phenomenological research. That's the English translation. I don't know which volume in the Gazan Toscala offered, but there he gets into eeriness of temporality and everydayness. He's trying to reckon with Aquinas on a being of God. He hasn't linked it to time. By the end of that text, he does get to temporality and everydayness. And then um, I mentioned the logic book, The Question of Truth, 1925, or temporality. Zorga is the facticity of time, temporality. Very close to what will become being in time, all the language that will end up in being in time, right there at 25. Most famously, we know the history of the concept of time lecture, but it's this logic book um, and the question of truth where we get into the or temporality. But these are, for me, the main kind of main pieces. So I have to then come back to some of the main paragraphs that I want to just that transition. That's the basic kind of schematic structure. That's what I'm up to. Again, this may sound very abstract and very empty because I, I'm not leading to some kind of defense of an argument that we can all jump into. So this looks very scattershot, I'm sure. But where do I find my grounding? Well, I do have the actual phenomenology of religious life PDF, where you can see the in the Greek, the Heidegger leaves in the Greek and then tries to interpret it. But these are the English translations. That's why if you see these parentheses to accept and receiving, those are referring to Greek terms that I couldn't, I didn't have the time to transpose from the actual Greek. But if you want to, I can go back and show you them if you want. But so this is the first quote I, I take out of the, the lecture. We have determined through the accepting and the receiving. That which is accepted is the how of self-conduct, how to have a life. Eric, you were talking about that, the enactment. But here, right, right in the very beginning, before he gets into Galatians and Thessalonians, he says, the main path which clarifies connection is 1910. It's about a turning around. This is in the biblical text. More precisely, about a turning toward God and a turning away from idol images from this one Thessalonians. The absolute turning toward within the sense of enactment a factical life in two directions, serving and waiting. So I wonder about that obedience, transformation before God in the office of waiting. This is a structure of facticity before the second coming, and we'll bracket the question of the Antichrist so we're not deceived. But something is transformed in Paul. No longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. The space of waiting, which is not being present in time because you're a new creation, on the other hand, you have the expectation of something that you can't see, and it can't be a repetition of the first coming. The waiting the parousia of the Lord is decisive. Thessalonians are hope, but not in the human sense. Let's not come back to any kind of human theorization, conceptualization, and let's just say human experience, your event of experience. The sense of the experience of the parousia, it's an absolute distress. I don't know if it's Bazorgan or Zorga, I don't want to use those terms yet. Angst, definitely not angst, which will show up in being in time. Absolute distress, which belongs to the life of the Christian himself. Entering oneself into anguish. Intensification, infinitization of that space in between of have been totally transformed. Maybe Paul's own conversion, who was not a witness like the actual disciples and had to debate them, quite frankly, to open up to the Gentiles. 
This distress is fundamentally characteristic. The absolute concern is the horizon of the Parsia, the second coming at the end of time. Heidegger's saying this is when we live. Okay, now we're at second coming, end of time, Parsia, English, not present. Expectation is not a future event. Tomorrow, manana is, I don't know what tomorrow is, uh, Monday. Not that future. Something else, some other kind of relationship to time. And it's not being within time. Here in Corinthians, we have a pre, oh, sorry, I don't want to read that one. Let me read. Okay, we have to make some distinctions here, as Heidegger already does, between the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, and the New Testament. Parsi has its conceptual history, a sense we do not intend here, says Heidegger. The expression changes its entire conceptual structure. What do you mean changing the conceptual structure of the Parsia? Parsia coming, adventing, presencing, usia, parousia, coming, arriving, changing the conceptual structure. Christian life experiences life different in kind is evident in this conceptual transformation. We're talking about an event of transformation. There's the Greek parousia, arrival, and the Greek Septuagint of the Hebrew Bible, the arrival of the Lord on the day of judgment. So pre-Christian. Judaism, the arrival of the Messiah. You know, to, in fairness to Judaism, it's an insult to even say first coming. There is no first coming or second coming. They're just they're still waiting. So, But for the Christian, Parsia means the appearing again of the already appeared Messiah. So there's a doubling or repetition. But don't think of this literally. That's the phenomenological project. The entire structure of the concept has changed. This is what befuddles Heidegger. This is what makes the project so mysterious. One could think, first of all, the basic comportment of the Parsia is awaiting a Christian hope in a special sense. So now we got to bracket this too. What do you mean waiting? I'm not waiting for the train to arrive. I'm not waiting for the world to blow up and be reborn. I'm not waiting for the sun to swallow the earth. I'm not waiting for some evil dictator to arise and you know start a World War III. That's false. We never get to the relational sense of Parsia by merely analyzing the consciousness of a future event. This is all pre-being in time. Truth in the relational sense, different from all expectation, time and moment. The when, not originally grasped, and so far it's grasped in the sense of hey, it's not objective time. We know that we've already talked about time. But then again, look at this: not time of fatical life and falling. He doesn't say inauthenticity, but the falling in a non christian falling away from the already first revelation. He does not say when because this is an inadequate expression. It doesn't suffice. So what, what do we even mean by temporalizing the time? This is a famous uh, quote that everyone uses. How the Parsia stands my life, the first back to the enactment of life itself. There you go. How to enact life. Enact the new life, new being in Christ, the awaiting and serving, not just the commandment to love and love one another, love the neighbor, the most profound of all commandments. But how are you going to enact this? Death to this world. Or all of Jesus' strange comments about time and death. I mean, you know, he who tries to cling to this life will lose it in the next, et cetera. Whoever's uh, first will be last, blah, blah, blah. It's not ascetic detachment that you find in Eastern traditions. Some profound embrace of life that reduces this concept of the ascetic. The meaning of the when of the time in which the Christian lives has an entirely special character, some kind of Einzelite. Christian religiosity lives temporality, not being in time, living through time, becoming in time not trapped in a calendar, but lives temporality. That's very mysterious. One cannot encounter this temporality with the objective concept of time. We've already said that. And there he says, look, you know, the whole history of philosophy, the forgotten of being, basically, when Aristotle and Plato are picked up in the Middle Ages, reduces this kind of like primordial or temporality. He doesn't like his present neo-Kantian <laughs> um, historical present, you know, coming back to the concept of validity. What makes judgments valid, uh, valid? Okay. Um, being mindful of time, Alfred, 1225. We're supposed to end at 1245? Uh, yes. Uh... Yeah. So I'll end my talk. I, I need another uh, seven minutes, maybe, and then I'll be done. 
In late Judaism, the anticipation of Messiah refers primarily to such a future event, the appearance of Messiah at which other people will be present. So that type of awaiting is presupposes people being present, people being suffering under the weight of some kind of oppression. You know, this is the intertestamental period. So after Egypt, during Rome, Roman occupation, pre-Jesus, pre-Christ, appearance of the Messiah, people be present. This shows for Heidegger an acquaintance with the Christian prevalence of enactment as opposed to the event complex that's expected. So at least this experience of waiting is there. But it's not worried about what they what we mean by the appearance of the Messiah. But look at this. This is the big move. This is not even the engagement with Aquinas and classicism. This is something probably more Lutheran and Protestant. Something of the complex of enactment with God arises something like temporality to begin with. So the relationality of not God as a divine object of worship or a thematic concept, but more that relational experience of the divine from which temporality will arise. I love this. I have to put this back in. This is a surprise quote on Galatians, even though we're talking mostly about Thessalonians. And then we, we end the appendix of the whole lecture, that first part before he goes to Augustine and Eckhart Luther. But for now, the letter to this is now coming back to the Galatians. We've been talking about Thessalonians, where that's where Paul really discusses the Antichrist, second coming, parousia, both first and second. But what's going on in Galatians? This is the earliest Pauline text. Drawing, this is look at Heidegger, how extended he is, at least the reconstruction of the lectures. Drawing on understanding the direction of sense, the arch ontic, the phenomenological fundamental dynamic. At issues whether what is Christian explicates itself originally of itself becomes its own existential possession. Or does it atrophy into worship? So the newness of this, the passion of Paul disseminating in his letters. Behind this, the eschatological, what is this coming towards an end? What's going on here? How do we understand the Pauline world? Whatever people say about faith, and I don't want to be too quick about grace, but faith, not an empty state, final bliss. It's a complete opposite of that. We're talking about anguish here. What is that? It's not psychological. And that mental relation of concern entering the future, look at this. What about being towards death, being extinct since the beginning of the end of time? How do you live that way? What are you talking about? Are you talking about an asteroid hitting us? We only have a few days to live and we're going to you know, starve to death. No, he's not talking about that. It's not about being just a refreshing feeling of newness by being extinct. New principle of existence. Dying with Christ, faith is recognition of the redeemed Christ as Messiah. As its essential eschatological term that includes with it within it running toward the aim, like we're heading towards this structure of the parousia. Now in 65, in being in time, because Macquarie and Robinson say not zu kumpf, the future, the normal concept of future, but zu hyphen kumpf, the kumpf, the coming, coming up to, coming again, uh, towards the coming, the ho holding self, oneself accountable to the coming. Approaching the coming, not coming towards. I'm not coming towards Alfred's house. I'm not moving in time like an object, but I'm going towards the coming. That, however, is essentially the eschatological turn. So he is at the same time hope for completion of the beginning. This is Belendum, completion, Gansenheit of Dasein. Heidegger is desperate to figure out the wholeness of being, of Dasein, the Gansenheit. The being towards death without being towards birth. Remember, he couldn't do that. Section 72, chapter 5. Okay, here's the last paragraph in the last appendix included in the English translation on the second Thessalonians. And if this is unfamiliar text for you, uh, maybe a lot of you haven't read the Bible in a while, just it's two or three pages. Read this second chapter in the second letter of the Thessalonians. There are two letters to the Thessalonians. That's the fullest statement of the Antichrist. And this is where, this is what I do is looking at. But here he goes. This, this introduction question of the Antichrist through the decisive existential parousia problem. Dasein analytic in the question of being is what we see in being in time. But here we have two other terms, decisive existential ontological question of the Antichrist is the parousia problem, the coming, and the lived temporality. Under the aspect of pure faith holding firm, a sign of time, and I don't want to say symbol, 
or sign, and it's definitely not signification in the language, or and definitely not the cross. <laughs> meaning of time, the meaning of being, that's what he's concerned about being in time, but I'm what, concerned, and he's concerned here with the meaning of time. No, 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 I got to take time for granted. Time means this, time's that. No, Heidegger's genius that separates him from everything from the pre Socratics all the way to Bergson and Husserl is he's the first to pose the question of the meaning of time, not just there posing the question of the meaning of being in here. He changed the way we're supposed to even like relate to it. And in all the texts leading up to being in time says, can we even have a different understanding of ourselves in relationship to the question? It's not what is time, metaphysics, but who is time? The who question. Apostasy, it's coming, that it's self standing firm. It can only recognize out of this firm standing. And how's it recognized? Not a worldly sign. Not an expectation of a Messiah. Can't repeat the first content, first coming in the story of Jesus. We celebrate that in uh, Vorstellung Denken, as Hegel would say, picture thinking, the Eucharist, the memorialization, Christmas and Easter, the repetition. But it's not anything that has ever existed, nor is it going to be something we can see or intuit with our human subjectivity. The verse of God signifies as the sign of the end of time. I got to bracket this because we have to think now through this anti-Semitic dimension. I don't want to minimize this question at all, but this is not the space for me to engage in it. What is it, what's going on here with Heidegger in 19, 20, 21? What does he mean by the anomalous, without law? Son of ruin, he falls in ruin. Final fate of God, adversing, undertaking to be a first to pose, rise again, sit in the temple, take the place of God, taking the place event of God. Meaning of adversity to God, decisive sign of time. All right. So the only thing I want to to be mindful at time, because I know how cumbersome this is, just listening to me read these passages and talk about them. What do I want to introduce from 65? Because I'm assuming most of us know pretty intimately being in time. I'm not going to repeat it, but I already mentioned this problem with the Zukunft. We're more interested in this hyphen. This is from the translators, but now Macquarie Robinson. Come towards, come up to. Uh, hand days is um, nice weather. You can say that the weather is ni nice weather today. Well, you can separate nice and weather, and they don't have to refer to each other. Nice could just mean as an adjective, nice person, nice weather. But of course, refers to something. But the zoo common, you, you got to bracket the two towards and also any content of the coming. That's a mystery in Heidegger. You, you don't live past your death. You're not going to live and come back and tell us about it. It's not a moment in life. It is the greatest possibility to be. It's a possibility, first of all. Impossibility is a possibility. So, um, And it's phenomenologically reduced, meaning it's not perishing or looking at someone else die or you know, you being shot and dying and telling us, oh my gosh, I'm dying. No, I don't, it, it's, it's the ontological project. What happens after death, that's not a Heideggerian concern. That's religion and, you know, and quite frankly, science. The elf and the data, so you can't attach an, an object to the common. So I'm going to take that piece. Um, I'm not going to get into ecstatic temporality because what I really want to read is the last two paragraphs. That's the only, I, I wish I could read all the slides so I can just sort of repeat, give us a refresher of what's happening inside 65. But I'll take us straight to the famous ecstaticon um, paragraph and these, these, just these last two paragraphs and then I can end. The future character of having been in the present show the phenomenal characteristics of the towards oneself, letting itself come towards oneself, I'm adding to the text here. Back to, that's the already I'm having been, that's facticity and thrownness. I'm already in the world. I've got to come back to it. I'm not going back in time in a time machine in my when I was a kid. It's not linear time. But to what I'm already am, I am my having been this. And then being in the world with other things and people and Daseins, letting oneself be encountered by. So towards the cumin, to the uh, back to and repetition already past alongside present. Temporality manifests as the estaticon that he writes to Greek. I just put that transliterated. Temporality is a primordial outside of itself and in and for itself. We therefore call the phenomenon of the future, the character of having been, and the present, the ecstasies of temporality. 
Look at this. Temporality is not prior to this, an entity which first emerges from itself. In 1925, he says, care, Zorga, is a facticity of time. So it's going to be linked to Zorga. The being of Dasein is Zorga, and the being of Zorga, care, is temporality, and that's being in time. You don't line up these ecstasies. Don't, don't say, okay, well, I'll just start with this and then go to from present to future and then or, and past and then from past to go to present to future, future to present day. No, that's not, it doesn't, it's not some, there is a unity. You have to think about the process of temporalizing, but don't line them up so simply. What is characters in time which is accessible to the ordinary understanding of the linear flow of now points consists, among other things, precisely in the fact that it's a pure sequence of nows without beginning and without end. The one thing about Christianity and the Kairos and the Parsi is that you're done with those linear conceptions. It's not calendar time, clock time, objective time, physical time. It's not internal time consciousness either, protensions or retentions. The primordial temporality has been leveled off that inauthentic linear time. The grounded in the possibility of a definitive kind of temporality in conformity with the temporality, it temporalizes an inauthentic kind of time we've just mentioned. So inauthentic time, is temporalized, first of all, that, that has to come from the more soul's eternity, by the way. The finitude of temporality, when you think about the eternal or negation of time, is a type of temporalization. But the he wants the primordial temporal time. That's what he's trying to articulate. Did he do it? Not to my satisfaction. But this is important here. We've already we mentioned the future is prior. That's the coming towards the having been, the coming, the being towards death the unexpected, the fact that we go, you know, we throw ourselves beyond the present. We are incomplete. We have to reckon our nothingness. We succumb to the misery of the inauthenticity of just falling within the everydayness. But if we're truly concerned about our finitude in an ontological way, how can we ignore the future? But then, you know, the past, whatever we will have been, is going to arise from that future. So we're concerned with that too. That's ecstatic unity. The future has priority in ecstatical unity of primordial authentic temporality. This is so even though temporality does not first arise through a cumulative sequence, he keeps saying this, not linear time, but in each case temporalizes itself in their equiprimordiality. What is that? The modes of temporalizing are different in the equiprimordiality. The difference, I care about that, lies in the fact that the nature of the temporalizing can be determined primarily in terms of the different ecstasies. Primordial and authentic temporality temporalizes itself in terms of the authentic future in a way that awakens the present. I'm going to stop sharing here, and I don't want to move to my last slides, which I've shown here. Well, how do I go from all of this to four-dimensional time? I'll stop sharing here. The appropriation of those biblical texts, that central figure of the Antichrist before, between the first coming and the empty content of the second coming. And then this contrast of Judaism's messianic conception. And then the sublation, Alphabin, of the New Testament structure from Kairos to whatever proclamation of Parsi is there. Jesus' own sayings, and he says at the end of Matthew, go baptize in the name of the Spirit and Son, the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. I'll be with you till the end of time. And then he ascends. So he's, he's also giving it, not just Paul, he's giving us a proclamation. We're not talking about the repetition of that content. And we're not talking about faith-filled expectation of some kind of literal second coming. I mean, that's your talk, Eric, is to, it's not Heideggerianizing theology, but it's, it's so taking seriously <laughs> an authentic reception of the tradition of the primal Christian truth, as if you could literally be there with Paul. You want to talk about but your Dasein being there. But as a phenomenologist, which is what's been handed down and the, the grave decision that is to be made for all Western philosophy, divine, the philosopher is doing divine work, to think about this possibility and take it seriously. The way I do it is in the equiprimordial ecstatic temporality, using whatever inspiration I can get from the germs of the biblical text. And this is my, my end statement here is, the attempt to articulate um, beyond section 65 and quite frankly anything in division two, the four dimensional structure of that temporality, not late Heidegger. And the only resources is that first slide about the central text in the Western philosophical tradition. But my main guy out of Aristotle, Plato, Kant is Hegel. 
And Hegel is, if you, sorry, I know this is a Heidegger conference, but please, everybody just go back to the phenomenology and the science of logic, but absolute knowing ends with the cavalry of which he'd be lifeless and alone. Golgotha, the skull on the cross, the two sides and the double movement, nature and space, time and history, the notion's time, the being of God's time. He wants a metaphysical sublation of the religious conception of the parousia. It is a concrete, actual shape. So sorry, Bart. Actual is more important than the possible. But what is he saying? We don't know. Well, nobody knows what absolute knowing is about. And nobody believes in the quadruplicity in the science of logic. Four-dimensional time is the constitution of the parousia as a self-presentation of the being of God in that tradition. That's my thesis, as terrible as that sounds, and as audacious as that sounds, that's my intuition. I'm sticking with it. So thank you. Thank you, uh, I guess, for your presentation. Uh, you've been running a bit uh, long, so we have uh, a quick question or a comment, and then uh, we'll move on to uh, Mario. Eric? Yes, thank you very much for a very <laughs> illuminating lecture, which is really also related to things that I've talking I've been talking about. Uh, um, I, I'm just just a, a question, like what do you think about uh, uh, the way the Christian concept of uh, metanoia, of a change of heart, which is it is, it is um, central to to what Christ says, we need this metanoia to cure in order to uh, to uh, appropriate the kingdom of heaven, so to say. And uh, if the temporality, <clears throat> this uh, peculiar temporality of uh, of which you have been spoken, um, it, we, we, what role it plays in this no, new understanding of metanoia, of this uh, change, which happens to of the genuine change. Uh, that's so crucial, Eric, in this text, first of all. I think she ended in the chapter of the turning, where he tries to demystify the concept of the care. And he says the turning is, there is no turning, care. Or whatever. Turning, the turn, and here you see turning to turning towards God. But metanoia is repentance, you know, asking for forgiveness of your sins and then changing and turning. But repentance and conversion, convertio, certainly the Christian concept of turning and being born again in Christ. As the type of repentance that requires baptism for, for purely dogmatic uh, concept. But when I see the, the motor of the mirror play in the equipomoriality of the ecstasies, the movement and event and set of relations in that have to be expounded between I'm my having beenness, I'm the coming to the coming towards, and how do I have to relate to that authentically? And then the augenblick and the moment of vision in terms of anything that can then present itself. You know, to, instead of working with three ecstasies, which is all Heidegger is working with, the biblical material gives us a pre-existent logos in the prologue to John. Before Abraham was, I am. So there's this profound material there waiting to be developed as a being towards birth that's not back there in the past. So it has to do with the coming, the parousia. And inversely, there's a, a relationship to the future that cannot be one of pure endlessness. That's just a scientific modern fallen sense of linear time or some kind of simplistic eschatological end that brings in, as, as Derrida says, the end of history. Oh, that sounds cool. That's finite. That, that doesn't really go on forever and approach truth. But he says that's kind of like a type of, that, that negates the true nature of historicity, infinitude, because that, that also is a type of metaphysical conception. So how do we get beyond end or endlessness, the antinomy? So when I say turning, um, from a religious perspective, it requires, if Paul is right, dying to this world, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. But then what is the structure of the waiting and the serving and how should one comport themselves and act? I'm not interested in the theological concept. I'm interested in the metaphysical construction of four-dimensional time as a set of relationships 
that go beyond origin, non-origin, end, non-end, other than those. Kant's antinomies, remember? He has three of them, dialectic antinomies. Does the universe have a beginning and end? No, it doesn't. It doesn't have a beginning and an end. Time and eternity. Physicists, they get all the credit. They don't know what they're doing. Pre-Big Bang, endless cooling, rectilinear, big crunch, multiple universes, and then they spatialize everything. Sorry, I hope there are no physicists in the group, but don't ask those guys to do philosophy. Right? They, they haven't even read Heraclitus all the way up to Heidegger. But we have to do that. We have to work with Heidegger. Do we want to take ser- do you want to take seriously the early Heidegger on religion as a step beyond being in time? Can I ask that of the group, Alfred? Yes, That's open to the whole group. Yeah. Shouldn't we take seriously the relationship? Isn't this conference about before 29, after being in time? What are we taking from the early Heidegger? Well, it involves, as you said, Eric, an engagement with the phenomenology of religious structures to open up the space of ontology. Why do you take the phenomenology? Can I ask you why did you why is that such an important part for you in your project? I personally think that the the deepest level of engaging with Heidegger is to engage him with the issue of the divine in Heidegger because that is what he says, basically in many many places. This is the most important, the less God, the holy, the divine. This is the real Heidegger. All the, all the other aspects are ways to Heidegger. All, all of our di- different levels of Heidegger and analysis, but eventually this is where he want to get. Yeah, this is, uh, as Gadamer says, it's uh, clearly. Heidegger, Heidegger tries during his entire career to conceptualize the original Christian revelation. Thank you. Uh, well, is, God, okay, well, Alfred, it's up to you to figure out whether we should close and take a break. But there's a question yeah, in the chat. <laughs> it's a nice uh, end to your presentation, I think. Uh,